evening and we we'll be going through Sunday. So I'm glad that uh, each person, each one of you is here. You found your way here. Looking forward to what the Lord has for us this evening. But let's start off by opening up our song books. Let's all stand and turn to hymn 299, Rescue the Perishing, hymn 299. And let's sing out about a song that is all concerning reaching the lost with the gospel. Let's all stand, hymn 299. And that's what it's all about. As we get ready to start this evening, we want to have uh, Brother David Taylor, if you'd open us up in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your blessings for us. God, we thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to come to your house and to study your word and to pray and to sing praises unto you. And God, I pray you just be with us in a mighty way tonight. God, be with us in the mission conference this week. God, they, uh, you just stir our hearts for missions and for the work that you have called us to do. God, we pray you be with those of our church that are needy, those that are sick, those that are hospital, for those Lord, that have lost loved ones this week. God, we see especially dear and dear to them. God, we ask you now that you go with us and protect us, Father. We thank you for all the blessings you've given us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Let me, um, let me just give you a, a couple of reminders. Of course, like I said, we'll have our missions conference uh, throughout the remainder of this week into Sunday. And, uh, and so I encourage you to try to be in your place uh, each night at 7 o'clock, except for on Saturday. Saturday we start at 530, and, and that's going to be our international supper. And if there's one thing we, we all talk about that Baptists love to do, that's eat. And mm -hmm. so <clears throat> I'm expecting a lot of folks to show up. going to have some, some very good food. We'll have different tables representing a, a number of, of different countries with uh, those foods that, that follow with what that country would have. Uh, I still haven't found anybody that is willing to do balut. Um, nobody wants to wants to take a duck and I mean I know there's ducks around here. Just go find some eggs before they hatch and and cook them slowly, and you know we'll crack them open and you don't really know. Crack them open and you know it's duck surprise. You never know what what stage of the duck you're going to get. But uh, that's the Filipino delicacy. I guess we'll have to skip that one. There's also some other ones. You could do, uh, if we ever do Russia one day, you could do, you have somebody do a borscht, which is not too bad depending on how, how they make it. But uh, if you want to get authentic, you got to get a few um, few interesting items to stick in that borscht along with it. Um, a few other countries do like whole heads of goat and all that kind of stuff and eyeballs floating around and everything. I, if you really wanted to get into the spirit of it, we can make some really interesting stuff around here. But... I would imagine it's probably going to be a little more on the mellow side. So don't get too too afraid about it. Just plan on being here Saturday at 530, um, be a part of the uh, the International Supper. And again, we won't have a service that night. It'll just be the time of fellowship. And we'll introduce, uh, for those of our church family, we'll introduce the uh, Faith Promise Commitment Cards and what that's about that night. And that'll pretty much be it. And then we'll end everything off on Sunday. And uh, we'll be looking forward to what the Lord's going to do there. So we've got, uh, we do have with us uh, some missionaries already. We've got some more coming in. we got Brother Caleb and Miss Nora Bruner and, uh, and their brood of, uh, of little ones. And so Miss Nora, we've known for many, many years, many stories. 
her whole family. We, we got many stories we could, uh, but we're not going to go there. Uh, be nice with, to her tonight. But um, and brother Caleb got a chance to meet him, and since since they had met and, and uh, were married and all, so it's it's really good to have them with us. I'm glad that they're here, and they'll be presenting uh, their ministry uh, tomorrow night. But uh, tonight, of course, we do have Brother uh, Ben Sinclair with us, and the family had doctor's appointments and stuff, so they weren't able to make it this time around, but we'll just have to hold them to it. They have to come back through before it's all said and done for the whole family uh, to be able to meet everybody again. But, um, but it's good to have Brother Ben Sinclair with us. He's going to, of course, he's going to be presenting tonight what's going on in, in Cameroon and, and what the Lord has been doing there, as well as I'm sure some of you interested and can't wait to hear a little bit. Uh, about the Westco family and all that's been going on uh, with Miss Westco and, and everything since the passing of her husband. I'm sure he's going to share all that kind of stuff with us. And uh, But he is going to be preaching for us tonight, tomorrow night, and again Friday night. So I'm looking forward to what the Lord has laid on his heart. I've heard some things uh, and watched some videos of some stuff that the Lord's already been doing, which is what led uh, led me to know that he was the man to uh, to kind of launch our our missions conference and for the most part preach it for us um, dealing with the heartbeat of God. That is what our missions conference is all about. And Brother Butch, I totally forgot to give you my background that um, we'll have to get up there and have that done. It's got a little heartbeat going across. You saw it? Okay, you got it. Is it ready to go? Yeah, stick it up there. But um, but it's uh, it's 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 pretty neat but it's a heartbeat of god that's the whole purpose of the missions conference and so uh, we'll end out we're going to have brother mcguffey and his wife um going to be with us starting tomorrow as well as um uh, miss grant i cannot remember her first name for some reason it always leaves me but um but she is a single lady going to the country of peru i'm excited she seems to be a very sweet uh young lady excited to beat her and uh, for our church to get a chance to know her as well and we're going to have a good time we're also on sunday we're going to have uh Yes, there it is. Um, we're going to have um, Brother Bob Nichols will be with us as well uh, on Sunday, and uh, he'll be ready to give update then as well. So we got we got different missionaries coming in, different things going to be happening. Excited about what's going to take place. Now, one thing I do have to tell you um, tonight, uh, some of y'all got you got the, the post that we sent out, but uh, Ms. Edna, Edna uh, Cochran uh, passed away, I believe, on Monday night. Um, she was with her family around Smith Lake. They were spending some time together. And then that night in the midst of uh, spending time with family, she had a massive heart attack and was pretty much gone instantly. Um, they, they have done the arrangements. <clears throat> I had a chance to talk to the son prior to them making the arrangements and I let them know about everything going on. So they were aware of what we had going this week and uh, uh, had offered to have the funeral here at the church and everything. Um, but they've, they've made the arrangements, as many of you saw that, that uh, it's tomorrow night they're going to be doing from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock is going to be the viewing and, and time with the family. And then, um, and then they'll start the what, what they call the chapel service. I guess they're at Hartzell Heritage, um, and they'll start that at 7 o'clock. Now, that is our time to start missions conference. We're not canceling our missions conference. I'm sorry. Um, and, uh, and I will be here. I will say this much you as church family who have known her for a long time. And I know everybody here that possibly could would want to be there, uh, to be there for Miss Edna. She loved her church and, um, and, and I know that she, she loved her friends here. We, we were her family outside of her blood family. And so, um, all I'm going to say is you as church family, you do what the Lord tells you to do, period. I don't care if that means come here for the missions conference to start or if the Lord tells you to be there for a little bit. I don't imagine it's going to be a super long service. I'm not encouraging somebody to miss, miss part of the missions conference. What I'm saying is you do what the Lord tells you to do. All right? And I'll leave it at that. And I won't argue. If you say the Lord told me to go for a little bit, I won't argue with you. All I ask is if you go and it gets done and you have time, you're right close. Why don't you stop on by and finish out here at the, that night, all right? And so that, that'll be tomorrow night. I'm just going to leave it at that. And uh, the Lord doesn't lead you to go, then please be in your place here uh, at 7 o'clock when, uh, when we get started. And so, again, 6 o'clock to 7 is going to be the viewing. 7 o'clock we'll start that service at Hartzell Heritage. And I just want to let you all know that. Let's do this real quick. We're going to do our, our verse. Some of y'all, if you're visiting with us, it is good to have some visitors with us. I'm, I'm, 
uh, happy to see y'all. Thank y'all for being here. And I, I saw another gentleman back in the back there. And so thank y'all for being with us. Uh, there's another unfamiliar. Well, I think we've met before. But um, uh, I, I see some faces I know and some faces I don't know. And <clears throat> some of you I think I've seen before, but I don't want to know you. No, I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> um, but we, um, yeah, but I was looking for the book when I said that. But um, we, we, what we do on Wednesday nights, we have a week, uh, a verse that we do each week. And that's kind of a memory verse, but mostly it's there to be an encouragement to us throughout the week. And so we, uh, to do this, we say it five times together, verse, uh, the, the reference, the verse, and then the reference. We do it five times together. That is uh, a proven method. If you did that once a day, um, where you would sit down and you say the reference, verse, and reference, do it five times in a row. You do it throughout a week, pay attention to what you're saying. Um, it is a proven method to try to uh, retain each week a new verse of scripture uh, that can become part of your memory. And, uh, and so we do this on a, on a weekly basis on Sundays and then Wednesdays as well. So let's do this together. You see it behind you there. Let's say 2 Peter 3.18 together five times, and then we'll move forward with the service. Okay, here we go. 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 2 Peter 3.18. 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 2 Peter 3.18. 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 2 Peter 3.18 2 Peter 3.18 But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 2 Peter 3.18 Last time. 2 Peter 3.18 But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 2 Peter 3.18 All right, thank you for doing that with me. And um, look forward to Sunday. We'll have a new verse for us to do it. This time, we're going to spend a few minutes and um, we're going to hold off on that, that song for the congregation in a minute. But we're going to let... Brother Ben Sinclair come and uh, let him present uh, a short video that he has of an update and then anything the Lord lays in our heart to, on, on his heart to tell us and then get us up to date as to what the Lord's doing with them uh, and their ministry to the country of Cameroon. So, Brother Ben, why don't you come and do that and then we'll sing a congregational song here again in just a minute. Well, good evening to everyone. Appreciated the fellowship over there and the mealtime and and uh, great to be back with you this evening. I am going to share uh, some more, as your pastor mentioned, about uh, the Wesco family and, and the whole situation um, in the message tonight. And so what I'd like to do this evening, we, this was obviously not a planned furlough. We don't have new prayer cards, nor do we have uh, a new video presentation than the one we just showed in here in 2017. And uh, so basically what I have this evening is um, about... Well, let's see, it would have been around September and October of last year, we started doing some survey in some other regions in Cameroon. There are 10 regions or 10 states in Cameroon, and we started uh, sensing that the Lord might eventually be leading us uh, to another area uh, based on what was going on there in our region. And so as we prayed and sought the Lord, uh, we decided to check out some of those regional capitals, some of the other chief cities of Cameroon. And so we were able to get to two of those before uh, our whole life and, and ministry and everything was uh, changed, and uh, the Lord is still directing our paths in that. So without saying anything more, what I'd like to do is show one of those survey videos. It's about five, six-minute video, and then make a few comments about our plans as your partners uh, to Cameroon in the coming future. So if we could play that. I'm very happy to be able to tell you about something that uh, we were able to get involved in just last week. 
But before I do that, let me give you a little bit of history, a little bit of our philosophy here in Cameroon. Our burden here in Cameroon is Cameroon for Christ. It was more than 20 years ago, the first time I came to Cameroon, and the Lord clearly directed and called us to minister and reach Cameroon for Christ. We felt like the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16, when he received that vision of the Macedonian man telling him to come over into Macedonia and help us. And we followed his pattern when Paul went into Macedonia to reach this new continent with the gospel and plant churches. Uh, the Bible mentions towns and villages that Paul traveled through on his first journey into Macedonia. But he targeted the chief city, that's what Acts, six, Acts chapter 16 calls it, the chief city of that place, which was Philippi. And many were reached, a church was established, and then Paul moved through two other towns or villages that were named in the scriptures. Not that Paul didn't care about those towns and villages, but he had the entire region in mind, and that God led him to reach the chief cities so that the entire region from those population centers could be training disciples and sending them out to the rest of the region. Paul went from Philippi to Thessalonica, which was probably the capital of Macedonia in that day. When we came to Cameroon about 14 years ago, we targeted with our prayers and our focus the chief cities of Cameroon. There are 10 regions in Cameroon. The Lord directed us to the capital city of the northwest region, which is called Bamenda. We've been here the last, as I said, 14 years or so. The Lord's allowed us to see a church established in Bamenda and Bambali and Akum and a little bit farther out in places like Benade and Benakuma and now reaching out even into Kumbo, but from the chief city, the regional capital. We've also been praying for the other nine chief cities, the other nine regions in Cameroon, and the Lord has laid, raised up uh, missionaries and nationals to reach the chief cities of Yaoundé, Douala, Buya, and Bafusam. We are praying now for those last five chief cities. Last week I had the opportunity to visit the regional capital of Adamawa region. It's called Ngaundri. We traveled there by plane. Brother Tom Needham and his airplane took me and his son and his daughter-in-law Daniel and Rachel Needham. We traveled up to Ngaundri for about three days. As we flew up there, we were able to look down from the airplane and see little compounds and little villages, smaller towns scattered all across the Adamawa region. People, many of whom are illiterate, not been to school, no roads going to their houses, completely cut off, very remote from much of the world. We landed in Ngaundri, and we were able to begin witnessing, uh, giving out gospel tracts, giving out scripture portions and the full day language in the market. It was a great, great blessing. We were even able to visit uh, one family. Our taxi driver invited us into his home, and uh, Brother Tom was able to briefly share the gospel with him and his family, and his wife began to immediately dig into that scripture portion of John and Romans in her own language. I'm sure she has never read the Bible in her own language before, and it was clear her desire to know truth. We found that all over in Gaundari. People seeking for peace, people are seeking for truth. They don't know that it can only be found in Jesus Christ. Someone needs to go and preach the gospel in Gaundari. We were burdened. There are maybe as many as a quarter of a million people living in that city. Uh, most of them are probably Muslim, but maybe almost as much as half are non-Muslim. Uh, we saw mosques everywhere we went, and uh, we saw people who need the gospel. Adamawa is a great region. It needs the gospel. It needs a, a fundamental gospel preaching church. That might start a Bible Institute, train nationals, make disciples that will go out to those remote areas, preaching the gospel and taking the gospel to those Fulani, those herdsmen, those nomads, those people living out there on the hills all over Adamawa. Would you please join me in praying that the Lord of the harvest will raise up laborers for the city of Ngaundri, that chief city, 
and that the Lord will use those laborers to make disciples and to scatter disciples all across that region preaching the gospel until Jesus returns. Join me as well for praying for those other chief cities, chief cities like Bertua in the east, Ebola in the south, Marwa and Garwa in the north and the extreme north of Cameroon. These chief cities still need a fundamental gospel preaching local church that is spreading the gospel and making disciples. I appreciate you watching this video. I, I hope you will join me in prayers. Many of you have been praying and concerned about what's going on here in the northwest region. These other areas I just mentioned, most of them are French speaking. They're pretty much unaffected by what is going on here in the northwest and the southwest regions, but they need the gospel. And I would appreciate if you join us in praying for those areas. So about two months later, uh, we published another one of those videos of the town of Ebola, which is the regional capital or the chief city in the south region of Cameroon. You can see that on our website if you're interested. We hope, uh, as you pray with us, that the Lord of the Harvest would raise up laborers. I'll share more maybe tonight and, and during the week, but uh, we are praying that the Lord of the Harvest now will send forth 100 missionaries to Cameroon. Uh, since we've been back in the country and uh, we've been telling people that prayer request, asking people to be serious about it, more and more people have joined us in praying for that. Uh, I have the privilege this semester of traveling all over the country. In fact, uh, in a couple weeks I'll be preaching in a couple Bible colleges in Puerto Rico, Lord willing, and Bible colleges and high schools all over the country, challenging young people uh, with God's plan for, the, for this world. It's written right over there on the wall. And, uh, and also challenging young people and adults in churches like this to be joining us in prayer for 100 missionaries to Cameroon. Um, countless people have joined us in that prayer. Uh, dozens, dozens, scores of young people have been called to missions uh, in the last few months. And uh, about 17 now have said the, they're either absolutely sure or one, one said 99% sure that God is calling them to Cameroon. And so we're going to keep continuing to pray for the other 83 that the Lord of Harvest will call them and raise them up and send them to Cameroon. And so if that's going to happen, maybe there might not be anyone here or several tonight that God is calling to Cameroon, but we all can join together in helping to send those laborers to Cameroon. And so I appreciate your prayers. Lord willing, in June, I'll be traveling, as I said, this semester in high schools and colleges across the country. Lord willing, in June, there will be three of us, two missionaries, all ready to Cameroon um, uh, that uh, <clears throat> have already served the Lord in Cameroon for at least one term and are kind of seeking the Lord's direction right now, just like us. They're going to be doing a survey with us in June, and we're going to visit some of those chief cities, uh, maybe all five of them. I'm not sure how the Lord will work that out. And uh, we would just ask you to pray that God would make it very, very clear uh, the other two, they're already learning French, they're already studying French, they're already trusting that the Lord will lead them to one of those French-speaking areas. And so uh, would you pray with us that the Lord will make his direction and will very clear to us as we take that survey in June. So we want to thank you once again for your faithful partnership through the years. Uh, I didn't look back to see precisely when you all started supporting us, but I know it was when we were on deputation. And this month is our 18th uh, year anniversary with Baptist World Mission. So you all probably been supporting us for about 17, pretty close to 18 years. And uh, so those churches that you saw dotting the Northwest region, that is fruit to your account. And as far as we know, every single one of those churches is still going. I send out uh, a weekly epistle that I call to each of our, or to all of our church leaders by email, and most of them respond and. And they give the blessings and they give the challenges that are going on there. But as far as we know, all those churches are still carrying on, even though things are very, very difficult right now with basically uh, the civil war that's going on there in the northwest and the southwest regions of Cameroon. So appreciate your partnership, appreciate your faithful prayers, and thank you very, very much. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ben. And um, looking forward to what the Lord has for us, what the Lord has got on his heart for 
the remainder of the next next several days. Why don't you take your hymn book with us and uh, let's go one more time. Let's open hymn books to 379. Hymn 379, Take My Life and Let It Be. On the first, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my ready to sing the last verse. Ushers, y'all come down at the end of the verse. Here we go. Take my love and Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself And typically on Wednesday night, this would be our others offering time. But uh, during our missions conference, what we're going to do is anything that's not uh, designated for tithe and offerings or, or any other purpose in an envelope, any loose cash um, is going to go straight towards our missions conference, being able to help us be a blessing to our, our missionaries and in our, our guest uh, missionary slash guest speaker and all the different elements of of the missions conference and so if the lord lay whatever the lord lays on your heart to be a part of that then uh, tonight and throughout the remainder of the conference each one of the offerings we take up again things that are not automatically pre-designated will go into our conference fund to take care of our special uh, individuals that are with us our missionaries so let's go ahead and pray and ask a blessing on the offering and Brother Butch, if you would, pray. Amen. Be seated.
Claire comes and preaches for us. The girls are going to come and, and sing the special. drifts away as I look back on the years of memories of happiness and bitter tears through it all there is a common thread that cannot be ignored you were there teaching me to be your servant Lord all the is going to be going back to the back with the kids that want to go so all you they're going to head off with her y'all can take off that direction and uh, we're going to look forward while y'all are having fun back there we're going to have fun in here so brother sinclair thank you so much for being with us look forward to it. aren't you thankful that god's love has been there all along and that he will be there with us to the end and we do thank god for that thank the lord for his faithful love. Well, this evening, I'd like to ask you to turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and uh, I am very grateful to your pastor for this opportunity to be here this evening, and grateful to you all for this privilege to open the Word of God. I have two main objectives this evening in the message tonight. First, I, I want to share the testimony, if you don't know, um, our co-workers, the Wescos, the reason we're in the States right now is because uh, Brother Charles Wesco went home to be with the Lord and we brought his widow and the children back to the States. I'd like to share that testimony tonight and immediately follow that up with a challenge to all of us. Um, and that challenge is to get with the program. That's the title of the message. And that's what I'd like to challenge us all with. Not only what the program is, but how we as a church and as individuals 
can get with the program that God has in the world today. If you're there, 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'd like to read verses 1 through 4. Let's all stand together. I know we've been going up and down a little bit, but just out of respect for God's word, if you can, if you can, please stand. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, Thou therefore, and I know that many of you have been in church and, and you've known the Lord for a long time. Whenever you see therefore or a wherefore in the scriptures, you need to go back and see what the wherefore, the therefore is there for. All right. Hope you know that. We don't have time to go through all of chapter one and find out what that that therefore is referring to. But let me tell you, uh, on the one hand, it's not a very pretty sight. Paul says in chapter one that serving the Lord uh, involves tears and fear and prisons and afflictions and suffering and all of his local co-workers there abandon him and then he rounds up by talking about his chains in verse 16 now to balance that out and by the way we do live in a very sin cursed and broken world i hope you realize that tonight all right uh, but on the other hand he does also describe the joy and the power and the love and the peace and the mercy and the grace and the presence of the Spirit of God and the power of God and the re refreshing friend Onesiphorus. That's all in chapter 1 as well. And so we do thank the Lord for, despite the difficulties, that God's love has been there all along and will be with us through the challenges of life. But with the challenges in mind, he continues on in verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you. For what Paul referred to in chapter 1 is our holy calling. Lord, we thank you that even though we do live in a world with disease and suffering and challenges and trials, we thank you that your love is there and your presence is always with us. And that, Father, by your grace, according to verse 1, we can be strong soldiers for the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our service this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Forty-four years ago, our co-workers, the Wescos, 44 years ago, Charles Truman Wesco was born at an Air Force base in Michigan. A little more than four years later, Charles was born again by placing his faith in Jesus Christ as his Savior. And I don't want to assume that just because this is a Wednesday night and, and it's mostly church folk, that everyone in here tonight is saved. Maybe there is someone here who still needs to be born again. I want to challenge you this evening that coming to church cannot save you. Getting baptized cannot wash away your sin. I, I was with a man in the last missions conference we were in uh, just the end of last week up in Indiana, and he was sharing his testimony that he was, he was baptized as a Catholic and then he was baptized as a Lutheran, and then he was baptized as an Episcopalian, and then he was baptized as a Baptist, finally immersed. And you know what? He still was lost and on his way to hell. It wasn't until uh, about six months after he had been baptized in the Baptist church that an evangelist came to the church, and he realized he was a sinner, he was on his way to hell, and he needed Jesus to save him, that no church could save him. And that night he came forward, repented of his sin, and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was saved. And then for the first time, he got biblically baptized, right? After all, all that getting wet, okay? What am I saying? You don't get saved by a church or a baptism or good works. Only Jesus can save you. Amen. And at four years of age, Charles Wesco believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and was saved. He was the oldest of ten children. And Charles Wesco's parents raised those children to be soldiers for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not long ago, I was in the Wesco uh, home. Virgil and Rebecca Wesco, Charles' parents, I was in their home. And we were having a meal together, and some of Charles' siblings and their spouses were there. And uh, I couldn't help but overlook the fireplace. Above the mantel, there was a painting. 
It wasn't a painting of a, a beautiful vista or a beautiful scenic view or something like that. It was a painting of a bow and ten arrows. And on each of those arrows was a name of one of the Wesco children. Every day those children woke up and they were reminded that they were being prepared to be soldiers for the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it reminded me of Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, where the Bible says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. As arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Today, most parents, even Christian parents, are raising their children to be well-adjusted, fit into society, successful children. And there's nothing wrong with being successful as long as our definition of success is the same as God's definition of success. Do you know that the word success is only found one time in the Bible? Only one verse in the Bible mentions the word success. It's Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says this, And this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Your success, my success, is directly related, directly tied to our relationship with this book right here. Um, you young people, you, you may grow up and be famous someday, or you may grow up and be wealthy, extremely wealthy someday, but you will never be a success without a daily walk in this book right here. It says meditate in this book day and night and obey it if you want to be a success according to God's definition of success. Well, that's what Charles wanted for his life. At the age of eight, Charles was called to ministry, and at the age of 15, he surrendered to go wherever the Lord of the Harvest commissioned him to serve in this global conflict. You see, he realized that when he was born again, he was born into a global conflict between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And so are you. So are you. Something very formative happened when Charles was 12 years old. His grandparents owned a piano factory, and his grandmother gave him a piano tuning hammer at age 12. And very interestingly, a blind piano tuner taught Charles how to tune pianos. And Charles got serious about it. He enjoyed it, he liked it, and he knew that he needed what he called a tent-making ministry if he was going to serve the Lord. And that was what uh, the Lord was leading him to do even as a youngster. Charles became the youngest person ever to pass the registered piano technician's exam and get that certificate. And so he went out and started his own business as a teenager, tuning and repairing pianos. He also worked in his, father, his grandfather's piano factory and uh, became the official unofficial piano tuner for all the pianos that would go out of the factory. In fact, his mom told me some, one time she can remember they had 20 pianos going out the next day, and Charles stayed up all night tuning those pianos, one right after another after another, so that when they got shipped out the next day, they would be ready to go. And as a teenager, Charles started making good money, and I mean good money, like thousands and thousands of dollars in the bank, good money, even as a teenager. Um, in fact, by the time he got married and uh, there was an opportunity to buy a home, a good deal was presented to him, he didn't go to the bank and look for a mortgage. He just went out and paid cash and bought the house. I mean, uh, there's no doubt in my mind the way his business and his business savvy was going that he could have easily, easily been a millionaire or multimillionaire by the time he retired. But Charles Wesco was not interested in money. Charles Wesco saw himself as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Look at our text again. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. What does it say? No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. When you see a soldier on the battlefield, he's not carrying around two big suitcases, lugging them around with extra clothes and 
heirlooms and souvenirs from the different places he's been to. No, a soldier is not entangled with the things of this world. He's not interested in the things of this world. He has a mission, he has a goal, and he needs to keep his attention, and everything he carries with him is directly tied and related to the mission, what he's doing. He doesn't have time, space, or, or strength to get entangled with the affairs outside of his mission. There's a recorded message online. Well, there's probably several, but one that I've heard. And I wrote down this quote. Charles Wesco was preaching and he said this, quote, Serving Christ always comes with a cost. And if you're not ready for that, get your act together and go back to your prayer closet. This world is not our home. We are called sojourners and pilgrims and soldiers, not people with big homesteads focused on living in this world. End quote. What is your focus tonight? Are you focused on being a good soldier by the grace of God? Or have you found yourself becoming entangled with the cares and the affairs of this world? This world that's going to be burned up one day. In his late 20s, Charles was burdened about the need for a help me. And he began to pray seriously, sometimes fasting for a week at a time, praying and fasting that God would give him a help me to help him in the global conflict. One day, as the story was told to me, one day he was tuning a piano of a church in Warsaw, Indiana. Pastor Williams is the pastor there. In fact, I'll be there uh, next Sunday morning, Lord willing. And uh, he was tuning that piano and uh, got to meet some of the other family members in Pastor Williams' family. Pastor Williams also has 10 children, and the oldest of his 10 children is named Stephanie. We were in her home this week, just a couple days ago, uh, we got to spend uh, a couple days with the West Coast up there. And uh, anyway, he was tuning that piano and uh, got to meet Stephanie and some of the others, and, and especially Stephanie. And uh, as the story was told to me, that piano simply could not keep a tune for some reason. He had to keep going back and checking on that piano, make sure everything was working all right, check the tuning, and he kept going back. And of course, each time he would go back, he would make sure Stephanie was around and that they could spend a little time together. And the Lord worked it out. They got married, and immediately the Lord allowed them to begin raising up their army of arrows to serve the Lord as well. They have six boys and two girls. And they want their children to be soldiers for the Lord Jesus Christ. A few years ago, Charles got his overseas commission from the captain of the hosts of the armies of the Lord to serve the Lord overseas. And Charles and his wife and their two oldest children, their two oldest boys, took a survey, a month-long survey in Africa, seeking where the Lord might put them. Uh, they went to three different countries in Africa. They ended up in Cameroon. At the end of that week and a half or so, they ended up in our home. And uh, we got to spend some time with the West Coast, staying up very late into the night each night, talking about the Lord and the Word of God and how to reach Cameroon for Christ. And as Charles put it, the Lord knit our hearts together in those days. And uh, they returned to the States, and as the Lord guide, guided and directed clearly, they began deputation to join us as co-workers in Cameroon almost immediately upon their return to the States. Now that was... That was just over two years ago. During the first year of their deputation, um, a conflict started in Cameroon. In Cameroon, as you saw on the map tonight in the video, there are 10 regions or 10 states in Cameroon. The two that border Nigeria right now are in a protest. They're in a, a movement to secede from the rest of Cameroon. They want to form their own country called Ambazonia. And so at first it was just some protests and some marches, but then uh, it escalated and escalated and until it became more and more violent and the protests became more direct and so forth. And so here we were in the northwest region, where, which is one of the regions where all this is going on, and we began to seek the Lord. Lord, do you want us to stay here in this area 
do you want us to move to another part of Cameroon? It was during that time that we began to survey some of those areas. That video that you just saw was recorded during that time. And we said, Lord, what do we do? And we sought counsel and we sought the word of God. And as we prayed, we came to the realization that the only way peace is going to come to Cameroon is through the gospel of peace. It's not going to be through bullets or diplomats. It's not going to be through protests. It's only going to be through the gospel. And the government and the separatists are not preaching the gospel. Somebody's got to be there to preach the gospel if peace is going to last. So by God's grace and his leading, we determined that God wanted us to remain there. The West Coast finished their deputation. On October 18th, after selling their home, giving away their business and, and almost all of their possessions, they moved to Cameroon. I picked them up in the airport in Yaoundé, the capital city, on October 18th, and we brought them up to their new house that we had just uh, rented some time before, got some furniture in there, some appliances, got things situated for them to move into that house. The first Sunday they were in Cameroon, Brother Charles wrote to his father. He wrote an email to his father. And in that email, he wrote this statement. We do have a very caring and loving God to lean upon, be it here or in the USA, who is beyond doubt in sovereign control of who falls and where and to what weapons, even down to the small sparrow. End quote. That was just a few days. Not weeks. But just a few days before I was supposed to go out to the village of Kumbo, where I've been going every Tuesday, preaching the gospel. I take one of the Bible college students with me, each a different one each week. We preach the gospel, we disciple, we have a Tuesday evening Bible study every week, we spend the night, we get up the next day, we follow up with the new believers, I'm teaching a couple men in that Bible study to read, and then we return to, to our area. That Tuesday I got up, and as I always do, I had to call ahead to see if everything was clear. They informed me, no pastor, you can't come today, the roads are blocked, there's fighting going on, shooting and so forth. You can't come to Kumo today. So I called Brother Charles that morning. I said, Brother Charles, I can't go to Kumo today. Let's just go where it's safe. Let's go to town. And uh, I know you've got a lot of things that you need to get and get squared away and so forth. Let's go to town today. So we got in my car. Charles Wesco was sitting right beside me. His wife was sitting behind him, and Charles Jr. was sitting behind me. Wesco's came to Cameroon to tell sinners how they could have their sins forgiven and to have a personal relationship with the Creator God of the universe. And on that day, October 30th, as we drove to town on a road that I've driven thousands of times, we came to an intersection. One of those sinners who they came to share the gospel with took his shotgun and fired two times at our car. First shot went, broke the window beside Brother Charles, went right through my car and went out the back window behind me where Charles Jr. was sitting. And before we could even get to the hospital, Brother Charles Wesco was dead. I don't know why that happened that day. I don't know why the window where Stephanie was sitting never even broke, even though there was BB shots all over the outside of our car. I don't know why the BBs that were coming through the front windshield to this day are still embedded in the front windshield and did not come over onto my side of the vehicle. I don't know why when we got out of the car and looked in the back seat where Charles Jr. was seat belted in his seat, why that seat was peppered with bullet holes from that shotgun blast and Charles Jr. did not even get a scratch with all the flying glass and everything in that vehicle. I can't explain that. But I don't see the end from the beginning like my God does. What I just shared with you is only one piece, 
one testimony of the seven and a half billion pieces or people that live in this world. You see, God does see the end from the beginning. And God does have a plan. And that day, as we rushed to the hospital, I could not possibly conceive how God could use that for His glory. I couldn't possibly imagine that since that moment, we know of at least nine people on three different continents who have trusted Christ as their Savior as a direct result of what happened that day, including people at the hospital in Belinda. I could not possibly imagine that scores of young people having heard this testimony would commit their lives to stand in the gap and take to the mission field because they were challenged in some way by the faithfulness of Charles Wesco and his family. I couldn't see all that. And we still don't see the whole picture. Again, we're just, we're just looking at one little piece in the puzzle. That's all we're looking at right now. But our God, as Brother Charles wrote to his father, is a sovereign God who does know the end from the beginning. And he does have a plan and a purpose. And God has a program in this world. And even though we don't understand all the details that God is working on, I'm here to challenge us in the last few minutes that I have to challenge us. God has a program and we need to get with the program. You have over here on your wall and flags from countries around the world where you have missionaries. And that thrills me. Because this is God's program. God's program is not just Hartsville, Alabama. That isn't His program. God's program is so much bigger and so much broader. You see, I believe God is a missionary God. David Livingston said this, quote, God had an only son and he made him a missionary. Henry Martin, missionary to India and Persia years ago, translated the Bible into, from three different languages, translated the entire New Testament into three different languages and died of malaria or some kind of fever when he was 31 years old. Henry Martin said this, quote, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. The nearer we get to Him, the more intensely missionary we become. If you get so close to God that you hear His heartbeat, which is the theme of this missions conference, you're going to hear a heartbeat for world missions. God is a missionary God. I believe the local church is a missionary body. This local church has the responsibility to reach the world. Do you realize that? You have the responsibility to reach the world. That's how God designed it. God is a missionary God. The local church is a missionary body. And I believe the Bible is a missionary book from beginning to end. I took the challenge to prove that fact, and it is easily provable. I've got pages and pages and pages of notes, if you want to see it, of missions found in every single book of the Bible. I took that challenge personally, and as I read through the Bible one year, I discovered missions in every book of the Bible. God has a program in the world today. My mentor, my freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year in Bible college, Dr. Daryl Champlin, my mentor, I took every single class he taught. Even if I couldn't take it for credit, I would audit it just so I could be in the class. He had us memorize what he referred to as the eternal purpose of God. The eternal purpose of God is a phrase found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. And this is what he said, the eternal purpose of God is to call out from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, a multitude, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world, over whom he will crown his son, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, King of kings, 
and Lord of Lords forever. This is the passion of the heart of God that cannot be quenched. The obsession of his mind that cannot be denied. The vision of his eyes from eternity past to eternity future that will not dim and the destination to which he, almighty God, has committed his omnipotent, immutable, eternal being a destination he will not abandon. That is God's program in the world today. Every kindred, tongue, people, and nation worshiping and serving Him forever and ever and ever. And God is passionate about it. The very first command in the Bible, if you look in the Bible, the very first command. He creates everything in chapter 1, and then He gives His first command. He says, be fruitful and multiply and fill up the earth. I can't wait. It's as if God is saying, I can't wait till there is a world full of red and yellow, black and white, praising, worshiping, and serving me forever and ever and ever. That's God's program in the world today. And we need to get with the program. When I was in grade school, my dad came in my room one day and informed me that he was signing me up for Little League Baseball. I had absolutely no interest in baseball whatsoever. I'm more of a wrestler type. You can tell by my height. That's about as, uh, as far as I could go in sports or athletics. I am not a runner. I was talking to Brother Butch, and, and uh, he and his wife are runners. I am not a runner. He was talking about trying to do a half marathon in under two hours. And I'm like, I just did a 5K about three weeks ago, under two hours. All right? <laughs> Uh, that's about as fast as I am. I, I walk the whole thing, in case you're wondering, all right? I don't run, okay? I wasn't interested in baseball, not at all. But my dad signed me up. And I found myself on that Little League baseball team. No interest whatsoever. One day, the coach looked out in right field, which is, by the way, where you put the worst player in Little League, you put him out in right field, because the ball hardly ever goes out there, okay? And that's where I was. He looked out there, and he saw me sitting out in right field. Did you hear what I just said? I was sitting out in right field. And if I remember correctly, I was looking at this dandelion, wondering if I should blow all those little seeds off or just let it die of natural cause. I was not interested in baseball at all. And I can remember my coach seeing me out there and hollering at the top of his lungs, Ben, get with the program! I jumped up and I looked around and I realized you know, there is a program going on here. There's, there's a whole team of guys depending on me. If for some small chance the ball actually comes out here, I need to be ready for it or let my whole team down. And so I made a decision that day. I might not like baseball, but I'm going to get with the program. My dad took me out to the batting cages. We practiced. We would go in the backyard, practice. We ended up wearing out a diamond in our backyard in the grass because we played that baseball so much in the backyard. And you know what? The next year, I ended up getting a trophy in Little League, most improved, <laughs> which wasn't saying much because I think I got on base one time the first entire season because I got hit by a pitch and uh, got forced to, to go to first base. That was about it. That was about the extent of my uh, interest and skill that first year. But the second year, I got into it, and the coach noticed. I didn't get more athletic. You can tell I didn't grow several feet or anything like that. I just got with the program. And then the third year, I got another trophy, MVP. And you know what? I can remember, as the years went by, I can remember the first time hitting that ball over the left field fence and the joy and the thrill of my first home run. Why? Basically, because I got with the program. It became a joy. It became a thrill. That didn't happen all at first when I wasn't interested or getting with the program. Now, listen, I tell you that funny story because, listen, God has a program in the world. And you know what I'm afraid? I'm afraid there are a lot of Christians today sitting out in right field blowing dandelions. And God has a mission going on. God has a program in this world. Blowing dandelions is not a sin. 
Sitting out in right field isn't a sin, but you know what? It sure is a waste when there's a team that's got a program going on and you're sitting out there doing nothing for eternity. I want to round up by looking at this verse right over here on the wall. You don't even need to turn there. It's right there, Mark 16, 50. You guys were sitting really close. You had it memorized, all right? Mark 16, 50, okay? What does it say? It says, go ye into all the world, and the rest of the verse says, and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus talks about missions and reaching the world throughout the scriptures. And then right before he ascends to heaven, he says to his disciples, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go. Listen, if we are not going with the gospel, if we are not going with the gospel every day and everywhere we go, we are not with the program. What else does he say? He says, go ye. Now, ye is not one of those words that we hear or use very often. But I'm thankful that the King James Version has recorded it for us. Why? Because uh, in modern English, we have you for singular and you for plural. Now, down here, we, we, we've got it right, right? We've got you and we've got y'all, okay? And then if we've got a really big group, then we got all y'all, right? Or I grew up in Indiana. They just have you and you. That's all they've got, okay? But down here, we got it right. In, in the King James Version, we have you, singular, and then we have ye, plural. Who is Jesus talking to in that verse? He's not talking to one person. He's not even talking to just missionaries. He's talking to y'all. He's talking to everyone. Go ye, plural, all y'all. Where? Into all the world. Listen to me. Not just the easy places. Not just the convenient places. And I know that for some of us, that means that next door neighbor. Maybe you've lived there for some years and all he's ever said to you is, ah. Yeah. How you doing, Mr. Neighbor? Ah. Merry Christmas. Ah. Maybe, that, maybe, maybe that's the difficult challenge where God's planted you. Or maybe it's someone in your family. Oh, family is difficult to witness to, isn't it? But what does the Bible say? Go ye into all the world. And do what? Preach the gospel. Not the social gospel or the prosperity gospel. The gospel. The one from this book. The gospel. To whom? To every creature. I wish I could take time to describe each of those ten regions in Cameroon. I don't have time to do that tonight. But what does the Bible say? It says, into all the world. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, and, But ye shall receive power. Ye, all y'all, shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. What's the next word? Both. That's an interesting word when we're about to make a list of places. Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus says to you and to me, I want you to go both here and around the world with the gospel. That's my program. That's Christ's program right there. Now, how is that possible? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about in this missions conference. How is that possible? I think we all know some ways, right? The Bible says, Paul writing, he says to one of his supporting churches, Please strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. You can labor around the world. Around the world in your prayers. Did you know that? And you're commanded to both here and around the world. You can labor around the world with your giving. Did you know that? With your giving. Paul wrote to his supporting church in Philippi. And in the last chapter he said, Not that I desire a gift but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. What was Paul saying? Paul's saying, as you give to me, and I do the work in a country you've never even been to, God is adding fruit and reward to your account. That's how you, that, those are just a couple ways that you can serve both here and around the world. 
Bethel Baptist Church, my challenge tonight is clear. Get with the program. Maybe you're already in the program, but maybe you realize there's some areas I need to improve on. I need to hit the batting cages a little bit more, and I need to practice a little bit more. I need to pray, and I need to give, and I need to be spirit-filled when I go out into my mission field where God has directed me and called me to labor. Let's all stand together. I'm just going to pray and turn it over to your pastor. As we stand together, Father, I want to thank you that you've given us your word, the Bible, that has instructed us and explained to us what your program is. Oh, Lord God, if there's someone here tonight who has never trusted Christ, may tonight be their day of salvation. Lord, if there are believers here tonight, maybe they've not been saved long or Maybe they've been saved for decades and decades. Maybe they realize tonight they've got a little bit, they've gotten a little too comfortable sitting out in right field. Oh God, challenge them tonight to get with the program. Challenge all of us to get with this global program that you have outlined in your word. May we go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Father, thank you for what you're about to do. May we say yes to your Holy Spirit's leading tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heads down, eyes closed. Just ask you questions. We brought it up. We got if anybody in here said, Preacher, if I was to die right now, if I couldn't even get outside this building and something was to happen to me, wouldn't be expected, but if I stepped out into eternity, I don't know where I would spend eternity. I'm not sure. That, that I know Christ is my Savior. I do not know where I'm going to go for all eternity. But I sure would like to talk to somebody about that. With no one looking around, would you raise your hand and say, Preacher, that's me. I do not know, but I'd like to talk to somebody about my salvation. Anyone at all. All right? Child of God, let me ask you this question. Is there anybody in here to say, Preacher, the Lord spoke to my heart. <coughs> During all that was said and all that... Brother Sinclair presented this global program of what God has designed his heartbeat to reach the world. The Lord spoke to my heart tonight. Preacher, I'll be honest. I'll raise my hand. That's me. He spoke to my heart in one way or another. He spoke to my heart in what we heard tonight. Would you raise your hand and be honest? Say, Preacher, that's me. That's me. Hands all over the building. Opportunities here for you. The Lord spoke to your heart. Don't waste the opportunity to speak back. How about you come down and spend just a moment at an altar and ask the Lord, Lord, what is it exactly that you're wanting to do with me? It's not just giving. It's a willing heart that he's looking for. It's availability. The Lord spoke to your heart. Why don't you come down to an altar? The invitation's open as the pianist plays. Spend some time for a few minutes with the Lord. As he has spoken to you, it's worth in your heart. Don't ignore the leading of the Holy Spirit. Take the opportunity at the altar. Thank you, Miss Wanda. Thank you, Brother Sinclair. Couldn't think of a better, more fitting start to what a missions conference is all about. 
about presenting God's plan. A plan and a desire that was in his heart, in his mind, before he even created this world and put man on it. He already had a plan, and as was, was presented a minute ago, uh, showed the eagerness to be able to fulfill that plan in reaching mankind. And so let's, uh, let's take to heart what we've heard tonight. And again, thank you for being here, but this is just the beginning of it. And I know we've already had a lot of rain today, and um, come tomorrow or Friday, we might just have to break out pontoon boats and we'll just float our way in. But uh, the doors will be open. We will be, unless the Lord was to shut things down for some reason, but I don't see it happening. Um, but we're going we're gonna to be here tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, and then Friday night at 7 o'clock, and then Saturday at 5.30, and then Sunday, the regular service time. So uh, any, any time, especially our visitors, thank you for being with us, and you're welcome to, to come as many nights of our conference as you want to come. We love having folks visit with us. And if it could be a challenge to our church, it's what we're looking for, but it'd be a challenge to anybody that comes. That is just icing on the cake, you might say. But uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Caleb and Miss Nora, if y'all don't mind, um, if y'all go ahead and maybe uh, head back towards the foyer there. And then Brother Sinclair, I'm going to get you to do the same thing real quick. They got their tables in the back uh, and uh, their prayer cards, uh, things of that nature back there. If you have questions for them, again, Brother Caleb and Miss, Miss Nora, they're going to be presenting uh, their ministry where the Lord's called them tomorrow night. And so you get to hear a little more about that. But um, you can take the opportunity tonight as you're going out. Don't just pass them by. Be sure to stop by and talk to them for a few minutes if, if uh, there's opportunity to do so and they're not being surrounded. All right. Don't don't smother them. But um, spend the opportunity while they're here to uh, to get to know them and uh, get to hear their heart for where God has called them and what he's placed on their lives uh, for what for what he's called them to do in this uh program that he's got for the world and so let's just continue to be faithful thank you again for being here look forward to what the lord has for us tomorrow be careful going home and uh, we'll look forward to the next time we come together let's uh, let's pray we'll be dismissed <clears throat> brother bill bell would you dismiss